an absolute pleasure. So it's great to have him here tonight sharing his expertise online for you. Um, so Heidi, first of all, we'll do a little bit of a tech check. Yeah, I'm sure you guys, Jace, can we have the next slide, please? Sure, um, I'm sure you guys have seen this um, lots of times before, but just in case you're new to Zoom, if anyone is new to Zoom anymore, um, we tend to use the Q&A button for doing questions. Um, so if you're able to type your questions as you go along, um, yeah, please just type away um, at any point and then Thea and I will sort those out and ask them to Jason when he uh, pauses. Um, if you want to move the size of Jason or the slide, you can just slide that little grey bar left and right. Um, and at the end, there's going to be just a short questionnaire. As you close the webinar, I'll go straight onto a questionnaire. And if you could just spend a couple of minutes filling that in for us, that'll be really helpful for um, both Horse Tribe and for um, Jason at your horsemanship, I'm sure. Um, and the webinar, a lot of people have asked, the webinar is being recorded um, and that'll be available um, on our website tomorrow for anybody that's joined live and then we'll sort it out through your horsemanship as well um, later on next week, hopefully. So I think that's all from us. Well, that's a boring bit. And now we're going to hand over to, uh, to Jason and uh, can't wait to find out more about spooking and napping. So thank you, Jason. Thank you very much, Heidi. Thanks, Thea. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Um, I hope you've all got a cup of coffee or as I think Thea had a little glass of wine there um, and sit back and in, enjoy the evening uh, as as the guy said we're going to be looking at spooking and napping um, which is a, a very common problem uh, I find especially in my line of business um, so we're going to look at some of the reasons why hows and see if we can Give you guys a few ideas to move forward if you are happening happening to have these issues um all right we'll, we'll just kick on i'm going to try and um get through this it's just a bit of a an overview of of what we're up to but um there'll be lots of questions and things that, I, that you'll be able to ask uh, at the end when i say lots we may not have a lot of time so we'll see how we go all right, now this seems like a really, really obvious question, but I, so I thought I would start here. Uh, is my horse spooking or napping? Um, it's, a, it's a really important thing to be able to differentiate. So, you know, I've written the, the, first, the first point that I've made is what have spooking and napping got in common? They have, they are quite similar, which is why I've, I've sort of made that statement, um, is your horse spooking and napping? Because a lot of a horse's reactions will be quite similar. We know that horses spin if they, if they are frightened and spooking. And we also know they spin when they're, when they're napping and want to go home. So a lot of their, um, their responses to napping and flighting can be really similar, um, but we need to be able to differentiate. So what is the difference between napping and spooking? It's all in the ears. As um, one, of the, one of the guys or in, in my program, I often talk about this, eyes, ears and feet are the gateway to a horse's mind. So one of the first things I'll always look at if I'm not sure is my horse's uh, head and their ears in particular. Now I've brought along Woody. Those of you that have come to my webinar, my monthly webinars will occasionally see Woody come out. And for, if you're wondering who Woody is, here's Woody. So, so when a horse is, is scared, I hope you guys can see, see Woody. Okay, he's looking quite happy. He's back on back on camera. Um, so, so when Woody's uh, a bit worried, or your horse is a little bit worried and looking to spook, you'll see both ears lock on to whatever it is. They'll be forward. The head will raise. All these things. I know I might be telling a lot of you to suck eggs, and you you would know this, um, but it is really important to uh, start with this point. Um, ears lock on, head comes up, and you, I think of the head as like a barometer. So the higher the head, you know, when they grow into that sort of giraffe and they feel like they're sort of 18 hands when they're only really 15, um, 
And that's like a barometer. If a horse is really worried, you'll see them tense and the neck will come really high and the ears will be locked on to whatever it may be. Um, that, is, that is a real telltale sign that they're about to spook. On the other hand, if a horse is going to nap, the ears won't do that. The head may still come up. And again, that barometer of how much they want to nap um, tends to be where the head is if it comes up a little bit more. Um, but you'll notice the ears will be slightly back. They'll be thinking backward. So, um, and that is the biggest tell about whether your horse is spooking or napping. And obviously how they move their feet and the, where the head is um, will depend on, on the, the, the degree of spookiness um, or nappiness. So it tends to be a horse that is spooky will be moving away from. A horse that is napping will tend to be move or want to move to. So they'll be drawn to something. And that's fundamentally what's going on in your horse's head and the reason why the ears look the way they do. Um, and it is important, I mean, why is it important to understand your horse's behavior before you start to train? Because you do handle these things differently. So if your horse is napping, then you've got to find a level of response um, in terms of the energy you put into your horse, whether you're um, using your leg, you might have a little whip, but you've got to find a level of response that creates movement. And that movement generally isn't always correct, but you have to lift that energy to the point where your horse is wanting to do something. And then it's about rewarding the right response, which we will cover a little bit later in the webinar. Um, with spooking, you have to handle that by being um, much more weight, give your horse space to sort of move and correct. So it's not about it's not about putting energy in to create a movement. It's more about controlling the energy that you have. And again, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail as we go through. Um, why do horses spook? Um, so again, horses, horses' instincts, which have evolved over millions of years, um, they're fight or flight animals. So it's their survival instinct and it's what they do to, uh, to stay safe, basically. However, there are different types of, um, of spooks that I, I haven't sort of written this in, but I, I do want to mention it. Um, you get the sort of the off in the distance spook that way your horse will sort of pause and look away. And in which case you can either, there's a couple of different ways you can manage that. But again, we'll come to that as we go. I've got a couple of videos to help with that. Um, but, and so there's, so there's that one. You've got the, the, um, the I call them the, the, the groin breaker. The one where you're sort of riding along and your horse suddenly just, stamps because it's seen something it doesn't go anywhere but it moves so fast you grab hold <laughs> with your groins it's like oh gosh um but it's 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 never too bad um and then you get the obvious i've got to get out of here they turn and do the do the old harry halt so so they're the three sort of main spooks that i come across and um generally speaking they're managed by doing um very little apart from staying focused. Otherwise, we have a control, uh, a way to control that again, which we'll come on to later. So it is perfectly natural for horses to spook. And you need to, um, as riders, as horse people, accept that. I know some people get really frustrated with horses that spook. And, you know, it, it, it can cause sort of emotions in yourself which only exacerbate that the horse's instinct. So we're coming on to the human influence now. And, and so therefore it's really important about how we manage ourselves in these situations. And it starts with 
a understanding that it is normal for horses to spook and every horse does it. I haven't ridden a horse that hasn't had a look at something at some point. Obviously some are more spooky than others, depends on the breed. Um, it, it can depend, depend on um, the environment. There's lots of things that, that will create spooking and it does come down to um, your horse and, and, and where you are. The one constant that I really want you to be aware of is you and how you behave in that situation, whether you're on a horse that is really spooky or, or just has the occasional look. How you behave will determine whether that improves or whether it starts to creep into to a problem. So the human influence is hugely important and can determine how your horse progresses or, or digresses. Um, okay, so before you train, um, so I would always do some, or check the basics before I train, and well, I've written before you train, before you think about how you're gonna manage spooking, the, the most important uh, control mechanism that you will have is being able to control your horse's hip. So you can see in these couple of photos that I've got, you can see my horse's head is, is turned to the side and I'm doing that with just one rein. So again, I might be able to, I don't know whether you'll be able to see it, but Woody, maybe you will. He likes an appearance, so I'll do it anyway. So you can see here, I've got Woody. I've got both hands on, on my reins here. Now, if I want to turn my horse to diffuse a situation, the most important thing about controlling flight and disengaging the hip at the same time is that your horse always has somewhere to go. Hence, it's best to direct a, a spooky situation or a nappy situation for that matter, rather than try to stop it. So a stopping scenario is when it happens a lot of the time when we lose control of ourselves, i.e. we get scared and therefore um, we end up getting into our fetal position, pulling on Woody and Woody's sort of, oh gosh, and we're in the, and we're, we're trying to just protect ourselves. It's a human response, but it's not helpful when you're riding your horse. Let me see if I can just get Woody a little bit more airtime here. Um, so watch for that, that reaction. And it does take training to do that. And so when I'm doing this exercise or the exercise that you'll see, I've got a little video of it as well. Um, you'll see that um, breathing becomes important and that ability to release the outside rein and just use one rein. So just the inside rein to turn Woody's head. Now, the reason you have to release the outside rein is that it allows your horse to move. Again, as I said, if you pull on two reins, it can restrict your horse. You become off balance, your horse becomes claustrophobic and it makes that situation, which might be relatively a minor spook, much bigger than it potentially was because of what happened to your horse in that situation. So if we can be proactive, um, should you feel like you need to be, then using one rein and being able to control your horse's hip is really important. Now, just about controlling hip, when you bend your horse like that, what will happen with your horse's body is the hind leg will step under or right over. So, so far under your horse that it, it, it comes across the outside hind leg. So the inside leg crosses right over. That is called disengaging. And when your horse is in that position, it is very, very difficult that, for them to buck, bolt or rear, which is why I find this control really, really useful with dealing with fight or flight situations and therefore spooky situations. So make sure you've got that in your locker. Forward cues. Um, very simply, if you use your legs, your horse should go forward. And um, I will say this, and this is an important thing. A lot of horses, a lot of people, some people don't like to use whips and that sort of thing. Um, and where possible, I'd try to avoid it. But 
I wouldn't avoid it at the price um, of consistency. Consistency to a horse is more important than a couple of hard taps with a whip to make sure that your horse understands that when I use my leg, you must take a step forward. And that's all it has to be. It doesn't have to be to where you, where you, your, your outcome, your goal, which is, you know, past the bins or over the water or through a ditch or wherever it may be, whatever the challenge is, all it has to be is a step in the right direction. And then you can breathe, let your horse know that you've done the right thing and they will feel that breath and know that they've done the right thing and continue that process on. Um, forward cues can become dulled um, when you ask, your horse doesn't step forward and then you stop. It says to your horse that if, if, I, um, if I put a bit of leg on and I just stand here, well, that'll, that'll eventually stop. So I, I don't need to listen to that. And that's where an inconsistency creeps in and that will create frustration and the relationship will start to break down a little, which can cause napping and a little bit of insecurity, which can cause spooking. Um, at the same time is if you're a bit overzealous with using your leg or a whip, um, then you won't recognize when your horse does take that step forward and you need to reward them by saying, well done. I noticed you tried there. Try being the really important word. I noticed you tried there. And this is what I think when you try like that, I feel good. And there we go. So really important to maintain and be really aware of those basic controls as you go forward. Um, <clears throat> exercises to help, help with, uh, with a spooky horse. So I've got a video that I'm, I'm going to show you. But before I show you this video, I'll just explain a process that I use on the ground. Um, and then you'll see the video. So it'll, it'll probably make sense. Um, so when you're ridden, you'll see a video in a second. When you're on the ground and you want to get your horse used to something that they might be worried about, it could be clippers, um, could be, you know, the, the good old bag on the stick if you wanted to go down that, that road. You know, anything that your horse might see you with and go, what have you got? The first thing to, to understand is, is that a horse is going to be unsure and the most passive you can be with a horse that's unsure is moving away from them. So when I start to desensitize a horse, um, whether I'm um, riding or on the ground, is I try and move, um, move the, the object that they're worried about away from them. So if I'm leading my horse and I've got a, an umbrella in my hand, let's say, I'll lead along with the umbrella in my hand and I'll be walking away from the horse and it follows me and I'll feel it sort of tugging. It won't want to follow me because it's looking at the umbrella. It'll be worried. Um, and I'll keep leading my horse around, walking off to the left and to the right until I feel my horse start to relax and just follow me along with the umbrella. Now, the reason that works so well is because you're behaving more like a prey animal. Um, if you were to go to the horse, here, this is an umbrella, have a look. <laughs> you're going to the horse and that's more predatory. So you're likely to give your horse a real fright doing that. You're doing this first step in terms of desensitizing your horse allows your horse to take it in um, and stops your horse from going over, over that, um, I, I call it a comfort line or becoming incoherent. So once a horse gets too far past their comfort line or, their, or feeling comfortable, um, and goes into that point of being incoherent, then they can't learn and it's, you know, and you get dragged around quite a bit. So the idea of all training, all teaching is to challenge and find that level. And that's, that's a job that we, sh we all should be looking to do if we, wanna, if we wanna progress with our horses and horses love it when they can learn and they become more comfortable with their environment because I'm not sure about this. Hang on, I think I get it. And the more they get it, the more comfortable they become with the world. And so everything starts to, to fall into place and the relationship builds. So it's a really important thing to, to bear in mind. 
So once you've got that first process done, then I might teach them to, to stand and introduce it. So I'll just sort of move it around them while they're standing there. So I've got most of the real flight out. Now I'll move it around or, or whatever, so a couple of meters away while I'm looking at them. Might do the left side, might do the right side. Um, and if they move, then I'll just continue. If I'm going at this rhythm and the horse is worried and starts moving away from me, so long as they don't become incoherent, that means I've probably gone a little bit too far, which means I might stop, adjust and start again, or go back a step. I'll just give it a wave and then um, wait for them to stop. When they stop, that's the desired res response that I'm looking for. I breathe, let them know that's all you have to do. And we, um, we allow them to take that on board. The next time they see it, they think, well, if I stand here, it's gonna be all right. And then they realize that actually it isn't a threat. A, because it's moving away from me. B, because when I stop, it stops. And then we're ready for contact, which is the next phase of desensitizing. So being able to touch your horse with it. To start with, I touch with my hand that my hand they should be comfortable with because they've seen me around before. And then I move the object around while I'm touching them and create an association. This object you're worried about feels like this, feels good. So we create that good association. And then we bring the object in and we just work around the horse, just, just with touch and exposure. And hopefully they you doing this sort of process and there's more detail to it, which you can obviously see on your horsemanship. <laughs> um, but you, you, um, you, as you go through that process, you break down that flight, which is a really important thing to be able to do. And it's done in a process. So if something's not quite working, you can drop back a step and then move up again. Um, and of course, doing it once doesn't mean a horse is going to be good for everything else. They're not rational thinkers. It takes a lot of repetition to create uh, a, an association which is strong enough to make associations and build their confidence to the point where they're, they're happy with new environments and strange things. Okay, so that's a little bit about desensitizing. Um, now what I think we might do, now I've been chatting for a little bit, is, and you'll have to bear with me while I try and get this text sorted, so I've got a video to show you, and this is of the the the, um, the demonstrations ooh, um, that I did. I'm guessing you can all see me. Can everyone see that video? Heidi, I don't know whether you guys are there. Can't see the video yet. Jason. The video hasn't come just up. See, just see the slides. Okay, let me go. Okay. Let's try that. Yes, got it. Oh, uh, part can you see? I can see half of, I can see a, an island. Oh. Hang on, here we go. Okay. Sorry, yeah, I, told, go. I, told you guys, I told you this was gonna be a bit tricky for me. <laughs> we're, here. we're here, okay. So I did a tour recently with Charlie, who you can see in the background. Um, um, and it was called Meeting of the Minds and how um, how people and horses interact and how important it is that we understand our influence on our horses. Um, and here's an exercise about control, which I've been talking about, about controlling flight. So let's just have a look at that. And so, so here, I'm about to, I've got a bag on the stick, could be, could be anything. I'm talking, I've, the, the, the audio isn't great, so I'm gonna talk through this. So I'm talking about directing your horse and how some people will get really nervous and try to hold on, which we spoke about before. And actually, look at, look at me go, I'm sort of <laughs> moving around. So I'm talking about turning with one rein and then being able to release and relax and breathe is probably the most important thing to be able to do to allow your horse to understand they've done the right thing. So this is a great exercise. You'll see me approach the horse's hip. 
So there, the comfort line for this horse is very little. I only lifted the bag and, and that horse in particular was quite reactive. So if I was to wave it furiously, that would be too much for this horse and it would become scared of me. And so this wouldn't work. If this horse was really dull and not very worried, uh, then if I just did what I did then, it wouldn't be challenge enough. So therefore I wouldn't improve the horse's um, tolerance or comfort line. Um, so that little, that little bit, I'll just run that through again. Just, I'll just show you the, the last little bit here when I'm actually doing it. Here we go again. Watch the horse's hind legs when she does this turn. So we've talked about using one rein. Good, see that step there of the hind leg? That's the step that I encourage everybody to be able to do with their horse using one rein. And I now just want you to watch the rider. Sorry to repeat this, but your focus changes when you watch these things. So watch her hands there. She's done very little. A little bit, if I'm gonna critique a little, I would want her to bring her inside hand when she's directing with the inside rein outside of a hip. It gives her a little bit more scope to be able to turn her horse. If you pull to your belly button, you can get stuck there. And you start to, if you get stuck and you come to your belly and you haven't got enough turn, then um, that can be a problem. Okay, let's um, see if I can drop back to the slides. So I, I hope that was, um, that made sense. I always find with these things, it's, it's a good idea to um, see these things in, in process. Um, and that it's good to practice. That exercise in, in particular is not just good for the horse um, in terms of creating a good habit. If something worries them, if you repeat this enough times, you'll eventually find that I'm worried about that. I need to turn and look at it because I know that's what my human is gonna ask me to do. So it takes away that horse that wants to run off. You're turning and looking at the object, which will obviously stop them and give you time to be able to gather your thoughts and, and you know, make a, a more rational response yourself. Um, so it teaches the horse, but it also teaches you. It creates that more automatic response of, I need to direct my horse rather than uh, just hold on to my horse. So therefore making you a little bit more proactive. All right, so exercises to help with a spooky horse. Now, the, the simplest thing to do with your horse if you're, if you're riding is to just focus on something in front of you and keep focused on that and ride to it. Just being able to do that means that your body and everything about you is telling your horse to ride forward. Problems start to occur when your focus is drawn onto what your horse is looking at or where your horse is wanting to go. So if you start to look at what your horse is looking at, then you're no longer being as, um, as directive or, or as good a leader as you potentially could be by staying, that's where we're going. You start to go, oh no, that's gonna be scary. And you start to you know, react by either turning before you might need to, or, or just anticipating um, something going wrong. When you know, those what ifs, when they creep in, um, can make you do things that are not always necessary and therefore you can create a problem doing that. Um, and these things do take practice and I just do want to stress as well, I make mistakes all the time, but I'm aware of them and I'm always trying to improve. So don't think, and horses are amazing animals um, in terms of they, they want to find a, a good answer and you know, if you think, oh God, I don't want to make a mistake or I don't want to um, put myself in that situation, you know, be aware that no human or horse for that matter is perfect. You are going to make mistakes and it is something that we all need to, to, to accept. But 
don't be frightened of the challenge because that's where what we're all looking for that great partnership is you have to just keep pushing it it just has to be measured where possible which is why i'm giving you sort of these exercises to think about particularly the control exercise and then for you being able to focus and ride to that point and it is not always pretty when i'm riding a line on a young horse um, trying to get to that point sometimes i start off on one side of the arena i go sideways to about the center line or three quarters to the other side of the arena and then i eventually get over to where i want to be because they were worried about something on the long side and i wanted to get to the far corner um, and that's perfectly all right because i know the next time i do it i won't go so so far my horse will start to trust me that when i if i keep going here and i get to that point instead of going all the way around i'll just go more direct and so your horse builds confidence like that um, and as your horse starts to straighten up and you're able to stay focused then you can start to refine that you'll see in this photo you can see me riding a, a, a colored um, horse the black and white um, cob and you can see me riding along the line you see my hands he's on the line there so my hands are forward and my focus is down that line i am trying to my my objective in that exercise is trying to keep the line that's on the ground between my horse's ears and trying to keep it running down my horse's spine and it sounds easy but i can tell you it is very difficult to do um, and i was only doing it at a walk but balance is so important in terms of starting to get your horse more confident and being able to stay between your leg and hand the, the sort of riding that you'll need to do is quite refined when you're trying to get your horse to walk down the line like that. So I, I, I really implore you all to, when you go home, to either visualize a line on the ground or be really focused on a point at the end of the school um, and try to ride down that line, um, keeping it between your horse's ears. And you'll really start to notice your horse's, um, you know, little bit bent or easily distracted and looks around and the little corrections that you have to make to keep them focused um, it's really really a good exercise so there's a couple of really things and just lastly one of the things that really um, can create a problem or definitely won't get you to where you want to be is if if um, if your horse starts moving sideways we'll bring woody in again so if woody starts he spooks at something over here and he starts backing off and going this way. If I look where Woody's taking me, I have just handed my leadership over to my flighty horse. So that is only going to go one way. Um, uh, and in terms of progress, it's not going to be found over where your horse is. So, and it's not always easy because I know sometimes you worry about ditches or hedges or things around and and um but really if you can keep that focus on where you're going you'll be amazed at the difference it will make um okay so so i would call what we've just spoken about direct training focus on where you're going and ride there using those things that we've talked about our aids our ability to go forward and control our direction and mentally stay focused when we get there or when we're happy with where we are. I mean, we should be breathing all the time to be fair, but I know what it's like. Be conscious of your breathing. It's something that Charlie and I spoke about a lot on our meeting of the minds um, tour is, you know, and horses are exactly the same. When they get worried, they stop breathing as well. So it's a really important part of being able to deal with, with stress and with those sort of um, more intense moments get back into that rhythm as quick as you can be conscious of it and your horse will start to yeah things are all right my rider feels all right therefore they can breathe as well um so that i would call that sort of more direct training now we're going to look at another video so <laughs> you'll have to bear with me again um we're going to look at another video about indirect training and i'll explain this as we go through now, how do I find this?
where has everybody gone? Um, hang on one second. Oh, here we go. New share. And this time we're going to have a look at this video. No, not that video. Sorry, bear with me again. Sharing. Let me try this. Um, can you guys see that? Yeah, we've got psychology on the screen. Yeah. Well, you've got psychology on the screen. Yeah. Okay, let me just. Um, Sorry guys, we're, we're getting there, as I say. New share. Um, let's try that. How's that? Same one. Did that change? No, same one. Same, same one? one? Okay, one. hang on. <laughs> we will get there. Uh, why is that not turning up? see it how's that yeah we can see that one yeah perfect that's it i'm sure there's a really quick way to do this <laughs> i just need to press every button first all right let's have a look at this um so i'll just so here's a problem i went out to see a nappy horse so this is not spooking but it it is napping but um spook it can be dealt with um you can use this technique for some spooky situations as well. So she's trying to, this lady's trying to get a horse to go and we got rearing. So I said, okay, I can see your problem. Now I'm, now I'm gonna use this technique to try and help you. So what I'm doing now is I'm asking my horse to turn around on that side of the circle and relaxing in the direction that I wanna do. Forward, go forward, direct and move on. And as my horse goes to where I want it to go, you'll notice me relax there. She stopped. I've asked for forward. And really, I should have. And there I'm getting a big response there. So my horse is really objecting. Now, this is really interesting. There's the first change. So my horse, when I started doing this process, I'm saying to my horse, listen, you have to find this answer. There's, a, there's an answer. My horse is saying, I do not want to go up that drive. I don't want to go away from my, my pals back at the stables. And you can guess where they are. So I'm going to object. So I've said, okay, well, I'm asking you to go up the drive. You decide what you want to do. My horse says, well, great. If you're going to ask me to go forward, I'm going to go forward back towards home. And at that point, as my horse is going back towards home, I'm applying pressure in terms of directing on the bit and I'm pushing forward as they're going sort of back towards home. And then as they turn and go in the direction I want, I actually relax. I'm still thinking forward in my body, but I relax. Now, the reason I've paused here is because this horse wasn't too bad, got progressively worse, and then got really quite bad with tricks that it had learned how to, to, how to avoid this situation. But because I was consistent in my approach, I got a change. And that changes my horse thought, well, this isn't working. So I'm going to try and try his idea a little bit. And that's how I got a little bit further up the road. Again, relax and you can walk that way. So I've sped this up. This took about um, five minutes to do this. So we're not going to sit through five minutes, but we're just going to demonstrate. So you guys can see, relax there, breathe. You can go that way. Head goes down. As you come around here, I'm going to direct and push. Relax. Now we're going to the left here. This horse keeps turning to the left. That's my way out, this horse is thinking. And every time a horse goes left, aha. So every time I go left, that happens. So I'm going to try to the right. But now you, when the horse turns away and goes back home to the right, finds me directing and pushing forward again until you go in the direction I'd like. So you can see your horse tries all the other answers that's, that's a spook. So there's an example of me using the same technique. My horse actually, something did scare, scare, scare it there. So there, I'm giving it a kick, not down this side. Now, try again. Yeah, <laughs> I've got the old chicken wings going there. <laughs> but notice, you can really see how loose that outside rein is. I'm giving my horse every opportunity to go there. And again, there was a slight escalation. 
And my horse is now walking forward without me kicking or directing. I don't know whether you can see my hands out there. So that is done because my horse has tried all the options that it knows to avoid this situation, but they don't seem to be working. So I'm gonna try the option which seems the easiest, which is the, the uh, place where I relax and allow my horse to walk forward. So that's a great example of, of indirect training. Right, let's see what we've got, what else we've got in store for us. Napping, prevention is better than cure. So this is exactly right. And again, it comes back down to consistency, which we've spoken about um, throughout this webinar and the, the importance of timing and feel. So when I say timing and feel, it's basically being able to recognize when your horse um, does the right thing. That would be that timing. My horse has taken a step forward. <sighs> well done. It doesn't have to be always a pat or anything like that. Just take the energy away. I've got energy in to get you to do something. You're going backwards when I'm asking you to go forward, but the energy is still there. It's not till the horse steps forward that there's suddenly, it feels good. And remember, horses want to do the right thing. They're looking for an easy option. And if you can present it to them, they will take it. Feel is knowing how to generate energy. So a lot of, um, say with loaders, people have learned my technique to load a horse, but are worried about putting enough energy in to create a movement. Now that movement might not always be correct, which is where we need to, the timing to, to release at the right times. But some people will, won't put enough energy in to create any movement. And so you get stuck and then your horse learns that they can stick and that's where things can start to break down a little bit. So timing and feeling, you hear that from any horse person and it takes practice so, and, and awareness. So just bear that one in mind. Direction is key. So being able to control yourself and being able to direct your horse is really important. And by directing, it mean, it's, I'm meaning allowing energy to flow left or right or forward um, without sort of blocking. So that, that's really quite important. Um, just on that point, one of the problems I find with dressage riders in terms of creating a, a horse that doesn't get over spooking or starts to get nappy is in terms of my process, I allow my horse to, to go forward. I stay focused. I allow them to go forward and they might wobble. If you try too early to keep your horse straight by using both reins to keep them straight, you get um, pressure from the spooky object pushing your horse this way. And then you get pressure from you um, trying to correct that, pushing back towards it. And inevitably you'll be pulling on the rein, so you've blocked forward. So the, own, so the horse starts to think going forward in these situations is really difficult because I'm blocked by the reins and, and I'm scared. So I'm gonna, and they start to back out of it or rear or spin and you get some of those more dramatic type uh, responses or flight responses. So, so bear that in mind, and which is why I have a process of, to deal with spooking. It doesn't always look pretty at the beginning, but I'm, I'm allowing forward to keep happening. And forward is so important um, in terms of allowing energy to flow. And that's why left and right are really important because you're still traveling forward. Um, uh, don't let your horses cut corners. So again, it comes back down to consistency. I learned uh, quite a long time ago um, when I went for a ride out, I, I had this one particular horse that I rode out and I got to the end of the drive. Um, there was a reason I did this. I think it was on rehabilitation or something. I got to the end of the drive. I wasn't paying attention. I just turned around and went back home. And then I rode out the drive and I was supposed to go a bit further after a couple of weeks of doing this little walk, I could ride this horse a little bit further. And of course I got to the top of the drive and 
and I went to ride on and the horse dropped its shoulder and went to go home because I started saying, go forward, go forward. And sort of just, this is what I do and dropped its shoulder and went for home. And I thought, wow, that did not take long to teach this horse to, to nap, basically. I mean, I sort of, we, we corrected that, and, but, I, but it was like a light bulb going off for me. And I realized that if ever I go for a ride down a track and have to go back down the same path I, I, I traveled out, then you must be very careful that your horse doesn't drop the shoulder to turn back towards home. You need to walk around something or, or uh, make sure you pick your horse's shoulder up and walk a, 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 a proper half circle to, to go back home. That little bit of detail can be really important um, because once your horse learns to fall towards home, it only takes a spook or uh, you know your horse is having a bad day for them to go, I know how to get out of going down this track. I just do this and I end up going back home, which is where I wanna be. So yeah, be a little bit aware of your horse's cutting corners and that goes for on the ground as well. If your horse is, um, if you wanna to go to the left and your horse is sort of leading you, uh, when I say the left, I mean the left, <laughs> then, um, you know, I like my horse to lead on the outside shoulder, particularly when I'm, if they're a little bit pushy on the ground so that they're not, they don't get in front of me and start to take over and cut corners when I'm turning. Um, forward thinking and focus, we've spoke about the importance of that and what it does to your body. And something else that, um, that I do every now and again, which is, uh, it's, I suppose it's about purpose. So every now and again, with some horses, I'll jump on them and I'll check them. So I'll, I'll jump on, so long as they're far enough along their training, they're not gonna sort of try and buck or something if I tell them to go. But with most young horses, about three or four rides in, I'll check by hopping on and I'll say, right, let's trot off the yard. We're going somewhere, I'm gonna do this with purpose, come on. And it does two things. Um, I create a bit of energy at the yard and when they get off the yard and are traveling forward, I relax. So it makes them think, well, oh, this going out here is great. Um, whereas if you sort of dither around the yard and your horse is hanging out there, um, if they have that propensity to be a bit nappy or, or insecure and therefore spooky, then, you know, and you don't have that conviction in what you're doing or that sort of purpose in what you're doing, then these problems and this sort of draw can start to build and, and turn into something that we don't want it to. Um, I'll also, at the end of a ride, I do another check with the young horses and I ride past where they tied up and, and finish. I ride past there, down the track a bit and I'll hop off past home. And all I'm doing is just checking, are you, are you, are you, are you drawn to the yard um, more than you know, my cues to make you go forward to this other point? Um, and I, I always have a feel of that. And if I start to feel I'm going, I don't wanna go off here. I, that's where I feel nappiness and that's where I say, come on, I add energy until my horse feels like, oh, I've got to do something, so let's go. And once I feel them go forward, relax, and they start to feel good about going off the yard and, and going forward. Um, so there we are. Um, okay, we've got one more. We've got another video. This one's quite dramatic. I hope you're hanging in with me here. I've, I've gone a quite a long way into this, and I know you've all got probably questions hope I'm answering a lot of them as I go along. But um, yeah, right, you have to bear with me one more time. We're gonna do a little bit of a little bit of tech and I'm gonna to talk to you about severe napping problems. Um, and in this video, I'm working with a, a, a very talented young rider with a very talented young horse, um, but they, they got to a point where they were really stuck. And um, and you know, once you get into this situation, it generally means you need um, some, some help to overcome the, the initial problem, but still to maintain it, you have to have all the basics um, and the ideas that we've spoken about throughout this webinar. So let's see if we can get this one up first time. How did I go guys? I can't see it. Oh my oh, God, yeah. damn it. <laughs> what is it? It don't be good with horses. Jason. Yeah, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> um, let's try again. Um, let me share. 
I don't understand. Well, um, no, nothing. No. Well, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna come oh, out yeah. of the sharing and then I'm gonna find it from there. Okay. So just um, here. How are we doing now? Yes. You've got it. Yay. Got it. Again, I, I've gone a completely different way to get here this time. You'll be pleased to know. But we've got there in the end again. So here's here's a before and after. And I think there's some, um, Penny's put some subtitles in for this as well. Oops, somebody's car. Okay, so this is the problem. They, they could not get this horse off the yard. Um, but what I want you to, to watch now, I'm just going to just show you a little bit. Actually, no, you'll see it a little bit later on. But when, when watch, watch his hands. When the horse rears, what does he do with his hands? So you'll notice when the horse comes down, he puts pressure on the horse to direct it. When the horse goes up, he grabs hold of the horse's neck, taking away all pressure. And so this actually, okay, there it is. Oh. I've got, I think I might have the wrong video, guys. Dial it out. There must be some tips from this one. <laughs> well, hang on. I'll, I'll see if I can find the other video. I don't know how I've managed to do that. Um, okay. What can you guys see now? Um, nothing at the moment, just you. So, okay. so you're all looking in the background. Okay. All right, sorry guys. Let me let me just try because there is a there is a really um, quite a good video somewhere for this. Well, he clearly changed a lot because that was a different horse in the second clip. It, it really was. Um, and anyway, that's that's a bit unfortunate though. I can't show you the work that we did. Um, maybe I can I can share that with you the the work that that I did before. Um, before we uh yeah okay let's just let's just leave that one yeah if this if there's like a youtube link you want us to share afterwards we can do no problem yeah okay so that was the version without uh, that basically in that video and you will have seen the difference that was literally the next day after the lesson we've had and i've got a, a video of me working with this horse and demonstrating the um the techniques i used to, um, to get this horse back on track. And it basically involved using, uh, controlling the hind end, although there was another element to it, which I can explain to you. So if you see this video, you will understand. So I do a lot, I did quite a bit of groundwork with this horse. Where's Woody? And um, I'm just gonna bring Woody into play here, just for a second. So can you guys see Woody? There's, so when, when, um, when a horse rears uh, and they're, they're responding to the bit by rearing, if you use the bit to try and correct the problem, there, then it just leads, it exacerbates it because they've learned and you're just putting energy into the, into the problem. So what I do, and I start on the ground, I teach my horse to move away from my hand. So if the horse rears up, then I use my hand to just push the horse's head off to the side and which creates a slight bend, which brings the horse, as soon as the horse's head bends, then I can take a contact, bring the horse's head round and down 
and that allows me to access the hind legs. So I use, that's just a technique. I don't think you'll see it anywhere else, but it's a technique I've learned to use over the years with, with horses that have severe problems like this. But again, whether they're bolting, bucking or rearing, being able to control with one rein and access that hind leg is really, really important. Um, okay. So I think we must be getting there and thereabouts. And so it is. Fantastic. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for question. Amazing. Fantastic. Yeah. We've, we've got yeah, a lot sorry of about the tech. I knew that was going to be an issue. Penny <laughs> was reversing me. We had a practice run and yeah. <laughs> Um, no worries at all. We've got quite a few questions. So um, okay. shall we, we've got a few that all relate to being in hand. Should we ask yep, those? Yeah, we haven't really covered much in hand. Yeah, so we ask those ones together and then we'll come on to the others. So um, what do you do if you're standing still on the ground when the spook happens? So, for example, untacking yesterday and hedge trimming started up nearby, struggled to get her attention back on me. And then there's a couple of others that link to, to the uh, similar. So um hind leg disengaged does that work from the ground and then could this be transferred in hand to a fixed object that you can't face and follow for example static mirrors so they're all sort of similar i guess yeah so i suppose i suppose if you're doing something with your horse and someone starts your, starts a hedge trimmer up suddenly and you get that sudden a horse is likely to react and as i say you have to accept that i mean i would say that would be a fairly normal response I would hope that, and this is why I do groundwork and I work with personal space. Um, you know, there's some exercises that I use and make sure your horse understands your personal space well, is that they might go, oh my gosh, there's something scary there, the hedge trimmer. And they might move away from the hedge trimmer, but their almost instant immediate reaction is, I don't want to stand on my human. And that means that you have done um, you know, groundwork to say, you know, you're too close, you know, whether you've worked on your being able to back your horse away from you, um, move them sideways away from you. These are all really important things uh, that you need that, to have on your horse for that exact reason. You're not going to stop a horse from reacting in that situation, but um, if you've done some, some homework, then you'll limit them hurting you, I guess. And what, was, what were the other situations? There was... um, so the hedge trimmer, and then the other was static mirrors. So um, yeah, there was, that display, one, yeah, and that one was, was um, static mirrors was linked to, could you do face and follow with something that's static, like mirrors, because yeah. you can't move towards with it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they can't move away from you. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah and, and that that is another another important thing. So I would build up to mirrors and things like that. So I might, so you know, when I was talking about riding, a, riding to a point, what I didn't say, which is why these questions are great, is when I ride to a point, you got to think about that journey. I start riding to a point and there's, so there's a start and then there's a middle and then there's an end. And at the end of that point, and this would be in a completely benign envi environment, so the horse isn't worried about anything. But at the end of the point, I might get them to touch something I get them in the habit of, say, it might even be the fence. So I ride to the edge of the arena. I get them to touch the arena with the arena fence with their nose. Um, and I ride points like that, like getting them in the habit of getting to a point, touch it, and go off and go to another point. So wherever the horse is going, the end is to touch something. So that encourages your horse to go there as well. Once they get good at that, I'm also become really aware of their straightness. So if I ride down to an object and they, they, they get to that object and they finish sort of at 45 degrees, so they're a bit skew, I would, I would want to be able to move their body, so control either their shoulders or their hind end more likely, and put them back onto the line that I was traveling. So I start to create that more than being more exact. And the reason for that is if a horse finishes traveling straight, and they know that they're going to get told to stand up straight when they get there. They're going to be thinking that way as they approach it. So as they think about, I'm going to lean. Yeah, but if I lean, I know when I get to the end, I'm going to get straightened up. So I'm, they sort of 
that desire to lean away, whether it be from a spooky object or whatever, starts to diminish. And they start to think, but I'm thinking more about being straight because that's what's going to happen next. And therefore you're bringing your horse back into what you're after rather than a spooky object. So, so doing that in a benign environment is really great. And then you can start to approach a mirror. Now, when you approach a mirror, you could use the indirect approach that we spoke about. So you might ride towards the mirror. And as you ride towards the mirror, you get to a point where your horse gets stuck and doesn't want to go forward towards the mirror anymore, wants to go to the left or to the right. So as you come in, as long as you're not forcing it too much, your horse will choose to go to the left away from the mirror or to the right away from the mirror. At that point, you can go, okay, you want to do that, that's fine. Um, so I'm going to ride you around when you're going away from the mirror, I'm going to push a little bit. And it depends on the horse how much you push. If you've got a really sensitive horse, but only push a little bit. If you've got quite a sort of a, I'm just doing this because I feel like it. And you know, one of those sort of slightly more bolshy horses, but is still a little bit worried, then you might have to push a little bit harder to create a little bit of desire to come back, release. And you'll find after once they've tried to the left and they have to work, tried to the right and they've had to work, you'll come up and they might even stop. You might find yourself standing there looking at the mirror for a little bit. Breathe, say, see, I told you this side of the circle is a good place to be. And then you'll say, okay, now give me one more step. And you'll say, you ask them to step forward and instead of going to the left or the right, they'll give you a step towards the mirror. And that is a golden step because your horse has mentally decided not to go to the left, not to go to the right, but to take a step forward and take a chance. And that is the key to sort of, and then once you can get a touch on the mirror, then I just incorporate that touch on the mirror with a load of other touches around the, around the arena. Presumably you could do that in hand as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Same, same, exactly the same process. Yes, yeah, exactly. And, and when you're lunging, if you want to even up a lunge circle because they're leaning one way towards the gate, for instance, yeah. then just push a little bit more at the gate and then relax. Let them just cruise away from the gate. And then they're inevitably going to draw back to the gate, push them there. And you very quickly find this, I call them swirkles, this sort of swiggly sort of lines. So you, yeah, you'll find this swirkle turns into a circle because the desire to be by the gate goes away and they start to think, well, maybe I can be out here. It feels good. And then, you know, so, so uh, yeah, the indirect Great. approach can really help. And so linked into that, because I can imagine um, you talked about they may even stop. So if I perhaps bring in Sue's question here. So how do you deal with planting and going backwards? Because you might get, oh, I've tried left, I've tried right, now I'm going to plant and I might actually reverse. What would you do then? So, so at that point, the first thing to understand is your horse is going backwards because the door in front of them isn't open. And a lot of the time it is the rider's reins and it, they're not always aware of it. So be aware of, of, of your reins and how much contact you have. Now, when you're riding a going horse, you can ride um, past the spooky object connected and with your horse up and keep riding forward. When you're riding a young horse or a horse that's really worried, your horse's head and neck need to be out and forward. So if they can't stretch forward and they can feel, even when your reins are loose, um, they might be up like this. And, and I'm not saying you have completely washing line reins, but you have to be aware if your horse goes to bring the head forward, you need to be able to release your reins with that. That is an attempt to investigate. And any contact at that point, when they're that anxious or worried about something, they feel a bit, they go, it's definitely not there. And that straight away creates that sort of backward feeling. And, um, and if you're nervous and holding on, well, that's obviously why that happens. So be really aware of your rein contact. The next thing is your forward. If, you're, if you ask your horse to go forward and they start going backwards, you've created energy. Your horse is moving. So that's good. So think of that as a positive. It's just going the wrong way. <laughs> so all you have to do is keep that amount of energy. So don't increase it. Don't get frustrated. 
that your horse is going backwards, just stay with it. And eventually your horse is going to come away from where they're scared and they're going to, there's going to be, so there's therefore going to be more room to step forward. That's, that's comfortable for them. And then, and when they do step forward, they're going to feel you instantly stop kicking. And then they'll try that a couple of times. Eventually they'll go, do you know what? Going backwards doesn't get rid of this human. And actually I've looked at this now and I think I, think I can do it. And that's how you create that positive response. A lot of the time people get frustrated and as the horse goes backwards, they can build and use more energy. So they stop going backwards. And if you do that, you are making the spooky object grow teeth and, and you're confusing your horse because they're, they're, you've now pushed them past the point of coherence. They become incoherent now, so they're not learning. So as soon as your horse starts to move, in a way with enough energy for you don't add more energy but just keep it there until you get the desired response then stop yeah. fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. we've got one here um about the age of a horse so uh, my part arab horse is 20 years old can be very spooky at hacking i'm wondering how much scope i've got to retrain him with experienced help at his age and thank you i'm finding this webinar so helpful no problem well thanks um Yes, you can always help, but for me, with a 20-year-old horse, um, if you can sort of think about the stuff that we've spoken about during the webinar, and I think concentrate more on yourself rather than the horse. I think use those sort of breathing techniques or, um, or being conscious that you're breathing calmly, you know, deeply. I mean, you know, breathe into your stomach. It's not just a normal breath like we're taking now. It's a different breath. It's a, and you can feel your stomach expand and, and you know, you get that really good feeling when you have a breath. So it's that sort of breathing that I'm talking about. But that, that, that ability to focus on where you're going and just being really consistent about your riding, I, th I think will be probably more beneficial than, than anything else. Um, and yes, you'll find that will improve your horse, even even twenty year old horses. Fantastic. Um, this one um, is an interesting one. It's a question whether this is more for Charlie than it is for you. But well, I'll give the question to you because <laughs> Charlie's not here. Clearly, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. my horse. <laughs> My horse is very spooky, but I'm also a very jumpy person. So when she jumps at a squirrel or leaf, um, I tend to jump too. Does my jumping make it worse? And are there any ways I can be less jumpy so I don't reinforce her behavior? Um, yeah, yes. Uh, it, for me, it's it's more about being proactive. So, you know, I'm, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing you talk and it's, you know, it's all about the, the problem. You know, if I see something or if this happens, I jump, I do this. So just ch change that I do this, I get jumpy into I do this turn or, or I do, I, I'm going to, I'm going to stay focused on, on that point, whatever happens, you know, and I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say just go anywhere and do this. Sometimes it's good to just set scenarios up. So, or be, be conscious of it always happens here. And so I'm going to try this, you know, as long as it's a reasonable ask and put yourself in, in places where you can practice. I don't know whether that's possible for you, but I, I would definitely do that. That's why I use that, you know, that bag on the stick exercise so I can practice or get people to practice that response of turning, um, you know, getting someone just pushing, pushing the horse's hip or getting something a little bit worried towards the horse's hip and then me practicing turning. I mean, that is a great exercise. But I think, yeah, again, focusing on something positive, i.e. what can I do? Let's practice that. Mm -hmm. And where am I going? Let's just worry about that. And it's not easy, I understand, but it's really, that's the, that's the goal. Fantastic, thank you. Um, just looking for something that's a little different. Yeah, we've got, we've got a few that are involving other horses, haven't we? So there's, there's there's one where my youngster becomes distracted by the horses in the field at one end of school. She'll drop her shoulder 
and avoid the circle I'm trying to keep her on. Um, uh, I know I start to anticipate this and override when I'm heading towards the point I know she's going to run off which I don't think helps. What do you suggest in this situation? And then there are another couple, I don't know if they're linked, but there's, there's a couple, there's one about, um, am I better off hacking without other horses because my horse turns and clings to the other horses. And there was one where the horse jumped on the other horse um, further down. We're getting loads of brilliant questions here. So <laughs> we've, we've got a kind of, I'm conscious of time, so I want to kind of do an, an other horse scenario okay, question, yeah. really. Well, that's fine. So I reckon, I reckon you guys having having listened to this webinar probably already know what to do. If you think of an indirect approach, if you think of an indirect approach, you're making the right thing easy, the wrong thing difficult. So if the horse is where the, if, if another horse is where your horse is being drawn to, how can you get your horse to not want to be there or be somewhere else? So if you go and trot round that horse five times and, and allow your horse, um, say if I'm trotting round that horse and I want my horse to end up over there somewhere, every time I'm trotting around the horse, I just relax when I'm heading that way. Drop up and then bring my horse back around, push around the other horse, maybe do two circles, relax over that way. Pretty soon my horse is gonna be less inclined to be around that other horse. And because you're, it's just a forward thing that you're doing, you're just saying, go forward a bit more here, relax a bit more here. <laughs> Your horse will stay positive, won't get scared of the other horse, but there'll be more, okay, I've got to work here. My, my rider is asking me to go somewhere. Where do they want me to go? Let's see. Oh, this feels like it's where they want me to go. So start to connect a little bit more with you. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can use that, that sort of psychology, um, circles and reverse psychology to, to manage that situation and get your horse to be less drawn to them. Um, if you're <coughs> out hacking and your horse wants to follow another horse just quickly, um, you've got to practice. So you've got to ride in situations with other horses, but ride in patterns that are going to help you. So I, I, if I've got a horse that's um, worried about horses riding away from one another, I spend a lot of time I'm just riding like this, back, back and past the horses all the time, you know, and just moving around in circles, crisscrossing like this it's just a simple pattern and in the beginning it feels a little bit you know it can be a little bit sort of difficult and then eventually instead of just going 20 or 30 yards away from one another I go 100 yards and then 200 yards and then just over the rise and then back again and you know you start to you know use a process to build this idea of it's all right to see another horse going going away from one another the horses are, that are best around other horses, they've been through all this in one way or another. They've been put in, a, in, a, in an environment that they're able to, to work out. Some will work it out very quickly. Some you'll need to do a lot of repetitions um, of this, but you need to put them in that environment and have a, have a controlled sort of pattern that you can build on. That's, that's my advice for that. Fantastic. I think that's great. I think that's pretty good advice for a lot of the questions, I think. Yeah. Um, we, and there's another one that links to that. So um, someone asking, how long would you expect this to take to improve if consistently hacking out and go through the same process? But I think you just said that it might be quite quick or it might take quite a long time. It really does depend on the horse and, you know, how, you know a little bit how you're riding it. I find, you know, if you find yourself sort of overstretching, you become a little bit tense and, and slightly contracted in your way of riding, then, you know, it, it, can, it can take a bit longer. Whereas if you're sort of doing it with a bit of positivity, and that's why I say don't overstretch yourself too much. You're better off staying positive about it and having a good experience yourself as much as your horse than putting yourself in a place where you sort of think, I just can't quite do this. So, 
so that that that's down to the horse and down to the rider and so therefore how long it takes will will depend but keep keep challenging yourself and challenging your horse because it's the only way you're going to expand your world and build your relationship yeah just a, uh, perhaps one last quick check. Carol asks, can I just check that you use the rein that turns back towards the way that they spooked from? Yeah, so that's a really good question um, because I've given you a sort of a, a toolbox, as it were, for, for spooking or napping. Um, and if I feel like a horse is, is really going to run off with me, then I will definitely use a one rein and turn back towards the object. So you would have, if you remember that video, I was turning towards the object. And when, when I turned towards the object in the video, you will notice that I stopped. So I teach the horses, if they turn and look at whatever was scaring them, it goes away. So that's how it builds confidence in the horse. And they start to think, well, if that scares me, I've got to look at it. And again, that takes away that real run out of your horse. If it's not too bad, you just stay focused on where you're going and ride past. And then you can refine that into a really straight line. If your horse is just, I just, you just can't quite generate the movement to get where you want to go, then maybe an indirect approach might be useful. Being able to ride behind a push when you're away from the object and relax when you're going towards it a little bit. You know, so it gives you a sort of options. And I think that's really important when you're dealing with spooky situations because, you know, sometimes you end up in a situation you think, I don't know what to do now. This, this, this isn't the prescribed way to deal with it. So I'm giving you ideas that you can take and make your own and, you know, use depending on the situation. Yeah, I love that you've been building a toolkit and you said something, I'm paraphrasing you earlier about making it easy for the horse. The horse wants to, to go, to, you know, to do something, but make it easy for the right thing for them to do, essentially. So yeah, 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 horses you make the right thing easy and the wrong thing a little bit more work. And, you know, they're like us, you know, we're, we're all inherently looking for an easy, you know, life. And so therefore, if something comes easy, then you tend to gravitate towards it. It's, and, and the problem with that is, and it, it happens to, to humans, is we start to go, well, I'm quite happy with my little bubble. This is what my horse does, and this is what I do, and so that's fine. But sometimes, which is, I'm, I have no problem with that at all, but if, if, that's where, if that's you stay within your comfort zone, you know, you have to be honest with yourself and say, am I staying here because I want to be here? Or am I staying here because I'm worried about what might happen if I venture out? And the biggest reward you will ever get, whatever you do, for me anyway, is being, is that sense of achievement. And I believe horses get it as well, because I'm not sure about this, but I'm through the other side. I don't know whether it's a sense of achievement. I think for horses, it's more a sense of relief. <laughs> but for, for us we get that sense of achievement and that that is relationship building stuff you and i we did this together and that is that is something fantastic that's a lovely point to end on yeah i was going to say exactly the same thing that was amazing thank you so much jason we've got quite a few questions that weren't answered but hopefully those the exploration of the ones that you have answered has, has given people a toolkit like you say to go and solve their problems and and crack on hopefully so yeah, yeah no, that's been well, fabulous i could talk all night about it but yeah. uh, <laughs> and you know, jason people can find out more if they want even more of your knowledge and more specialist help tell them where they can find you and there's a there's an offer for the horse drive isn't there yeah i think i think um i, th I think there's some we're sending some stuff out i mean my my members obviously get access to monthly webinars that i do have guest speakers um and we do monthly demon demonstrations as well so I actually video myself sort of working with a horse and that sort of thing and then I've got my program on your horsemanship so if you want to know more about it go to yourhorsemanship.com and you can find out uh, you know what, what I get up to um, and obviously I'll be at horse fest next year really looking forward to this this sounds like a uh, very exciting idea and I can't wait um, so yeah so those of you that are 
you know, I'm sure a lot of my members will be there because it's going to be great. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We've already got visions of you and Charlie dancing around the fire pit because I'm sure that was promised yeah, yeah, to us yeah. at some point. <laughs> yeah, that'll be, that'll be after a couple of gins or, or beers or whatever, whatever it may be. Um, Excellent. Yeah, it'll be great fun to catch up with everyone there and have a bit of a have a bit of a dance, have a bit of a fun, as well as do a bit of a bit of educating and stuff. It'd be great. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank wonderful. Oh, thank you ever so much. We've got for those of you um, that are interested, there are loads more webinars coming up. We've got Dr. Andrew McLean, who's joining us from Australia. Um, I know you're in Kent now, but one of your uh, compatriots is joining us next week. Uh, it's uh, Thursday at eight thirty, slightly later, to allow him to have a little bit more time in bed, and he'll be talking about learning theory and how you help your horse learn by talking the horse's language in, as you use your aid. So really, really fascinating. And then for any of you who've heard of Steph Croxford, who is um, a massive character, she's an international dressage rider and she started up um, something called Shite Dressage United, fun, epic fails about dressage. She's an enormous character, as I was saying, she'll be joining us for an evening with Steph Croxford and that's on the 8th of December. That's a Wednesday, it's an unusual night we're normally Thursdays at 7.30. Um, Heidi, anything else before it, we say thank you? To I think that's it. Thank you loads, Jason. And thanks to everybody for coming along. We've massively enjoyed it. So yeah, lovely, yeah lovely to meet you all. See everyone. And like I say, I'll see my members shortly and I'll hopefully see everybody else at, at Horse Fest, if not before. Fabulous. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.